This is a presentation from the Wapanka Historical Society. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for sharing a little bit of your time with us this, this evening. Uh, we certainly want to thank Tracy. We want to thank the uh, Wapaka Historical Society for inviting us. Uh, we have been here. This is our second year in a row that we've been back to Wapaka. Uh, we did a, a program last year on Wisconsin's lighthouses uh, at, the, at the library. And it's great to be at the Holly Center. There are 48 lighthouses in Wisconsin. There are 11 of them in Door County. So about 25% of every lighthouse in the state is found uh, in Door County. Uh, we're gonna take you on a kind of a chronological and locational tour of the county. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, if you could hold them to the end, the program just flows better. And uh, I think we'll, we'll get started. All this technology is going to behave. Yes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> oh, that's mostly for me. <laughs> for the sixth time I've, I've turned it off, <clears throat> I always uh, like to remind myself. Just a, a word of caution. If you see those, these two people near a lighthouse and you don't want to talk forever about them, just, just walk just by them. Okay. They've been known to gab on for quite a bit <laughs> about lighthouses. This is our contact information on the back uh, table there too. There are our books, uh, a business card. Please uh, help yourself at the end if, if you're so interested. There we go. Most of the information that we'll discuss this evening come from these two books that Barb and I uh, have produced. We've produced actually four of them. Uh, the main one is on, on your left, Wisconsin's Lighthouses. It covers every single light in, in the state. We're also going to concentrate quite a bit on the, the book on the right, Cana Island. It is the premier lighthouse in Door County. We'll discuss that one thoroughly at, at the end. Okay, we have to pass the microphone. So many of you know the history of Door County with the hundreds of rocky miles of shoreline that you can see, not to mention all the shoals that the mariners could not see. So you're in a wooden ship and you hit a rocky shoal, it could be all over. So lighthouses were definitely needed in Door County and in very high concentrations, we were talking before, there are 11 lighthouses in Door County, one of the highest concentrations of lighthouses of any county in the country. We talk to folks that still like to use the lighthouses, even though they have GPS in their pocket, in their phone. They still appreciate seeing the lighthouses if the weather is bad, and I would too. So here's a map of Wisconsin showing all 48 lights, but we'll concentrate tonight on Door County. And I can get my map out for this one. It's a thumb-shaped piece of land that stretches out into Lake Michigan. Well, Michiganders use their mitt in their hands, so I'm going to use that. So here's our Door County map that shows all the lighthouses that we'll be discussing tonight. And that's you. The, it's, it's hard to explain some of the, oh, I don't know, the, the history of the county, uh, the history of lighthouses. We would have to be jumping around if we went exactly chronologically. So we are going to do that, but in conjunction with that, uh, we're also going to go to different locations. Several locations had multiple lighthouses in, in their history. The first light in Door County uh, goes back to 1837. The last lighthouse uh, in the county was built in 1883. Now that's only 46 years. However, from 1837, the last light that was decommissioned in Door County was actually 100 years after 1883. So we're talking o over a century uh, of work. The first light we'll discuss is on an island. The first lights in Door County were actually on some of the islands. We'll also talk about the mainland uh, shortly. Rock Island today is a Wisconsin State Park. The original first light in Door County, actually the first light in what eventually would become Wisconsin, was built at the very tip of Rock Island. It's called the Potawatomi Light. Obviously a Native American uh, term and uh, word. It actually means keeper of the fire or keeper of the flame. Pretty appropriate for, for a lighthouse. The Rock Island Passage 
is, is here. A little bit south of there is the Death Door Strait, where Door County got its name. Eventually, further south, uh, they, chan they channeled Sturgeon Bay all the way through from Green Bay, the waters of Green Bay, to Lake Michigan. But the main shipping route initially was this area around Rock Island, so there was a need, certainly, for a lighthouse there. So this is what it, they think the original lighthouse looked like. They believe a few years ago they did a dig and they found the base of the tower. So based on the size of that and some other remaining foundation work, this is what they think it looks like. Apparently the contractor did a little cheating <laughs> on his workmanship and on his materials and it was leaking from very early on. So it was demolished and a new one was built. And we learned that David Corbin was the first lighthouse keeper at the lighthouse that leaked. So he was the first lighthouse keeper in Wisconsin in 1837. The inspector came, found him to be very competent, a clean station, a good light, but he was lonely. <laughs> so he gave him three weeks leave and said, go and find a wife. <laughs> He was Time, not times were a little different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was not successful. <laughs> but uh, he had, we're understanding, a dog and he had a horse on the island as well. And he is buried though today near his beloved lighthouse. And this is what it looked like in 1858. A very lonely outpost. Everything came by water. There was a path actually that Mr. Corbin dug and cleared himself. It's about a mile and a half down to where the Thordeson Boathouse is today. But at that time, there was no path. We learned of Charlie Boschka, a lighthouse keeper who served at this lighthouse and then went on to stay in the lighthouse service for about 30 years. And someone recently gave us this great archival of a young man delivering wood. So by this time, the path would have been cut through the woods and that poor horse <laughs> is just looking like he needs a meal. He really is. So here's Char Charlie Boschka and his wife. They were married on Pilot Island, and he actually remained at Potawatomi for nine years and then stayed in the lighthouse service for about 30. Here they are a few years later with their family. When we first visited Potawatomi Lighthouse 20 plus years mm -hmm. ago, this is what it looked like. And they were forming a friends group at that time, and they had great plans. We want to put a new lens on top, put the lantern room back, we want to restore the house, and son of a gun if they didn't make it happen. It took them a long time. They raised a lot of funds. It was all private donations and some grant money that they got. But lo and behold, there there's the Friends of Rock Island. <coughs> we walked up with them many years ago, and of course they had the key for the building. <laughs> so we got to go in and see what it looked like before the restoration, and there was a lot of work to be done for sure. But this is what it looks like today, beautifully restored. They have a replica lens in the lantern room, and that's what she looks like at sunset. Beautiful. You know? This is Barb. Uh, Barb and I uh, were fortunate to be kind of guest lighthouse keepers at Potawatomi a number of years ago. Um, many times we think back of the history of the lighthouse service, uh, employees, families, and we think back of this time that we think is just this wonderful, idyllic, romantic nope. time. <laughs> it was a tremendous amount of work. Potawatomi today, it has a propane supply for a stove and the refrigerator. It has no electricity still. It has a pump out in the uh, yard to pump your water. So it really gave us a sense a little bit. I mean, there's modern conveniences. Uh, there's a new composting toilet, which we, we appreciate it. Uh, but you, you think back uh, to that era, uh, early 1800s into the early 1900s, a lot of the things that we take for granted today, hot running water, indoor water, indoor plumbing, many early lighthouses didn't, did not have those features. There is still, um, all lighthouses in Wisconsin and in Door County are, are automated. There are no longer keepers stationed there day after day. There's still a need at the Rock Island Passage for a modern beacon, and this metal tower provides that, but it's not the traditional government lighthouse that had families there for many decades. We are told, not sure if this is true, this may be the oldest original existing building in Door County. It's the original outhouse at Potawatomi. 
I, I'll, I'll just leave it to the to the historians to see whether that's to whether out. that's true. Yeah. We're going to journey now uh, a little bit south of Rock Island. This passage, the Port de Mort passage, it means the door of death, the door to death. This is where Door County gets its name from. Rock Island is, is up here. These two islands, Plum and Pilot, had many lighthouses early in their, uh, in their history. And we'll talk about the first one on Plum Island now. This lighthouse, as you can see from the date, did not have a very long life. Uh, this photo is really old. Uh, <laughs> very little of that exists today. They did a dig on the island uh, several years ago, even less than what you see in this photo uh, stands. It, Barb mentioned it before at Potawatomi. It was not unusual for some of the early lighthouses not to be built very well. Uh, this one did not last very long. So a little bit further to the east, Mariners actually, this is uh, Lake Michigan. The Bay of Green Bay is on this side. There's a rock pile out here called Pilot Island. It's about three acres, and there was a need for a lighthouse in that strait, so they built one uh, here on, on Pilot Island. And these are some archival photos from Pilot Island back in the day when it was a manned station. You can see how beautiful the buildings were and the three keepers all dressed up for an official photo, it appears, sitting at, a, at the kitchen table. Look at this gentleman. He is a lifesaver. This is Martin Knutson, and he served in the Lighthouse Service for 44 years. He actually rescued several people that two ships collided on Lake Michigan right at Pilot Island. There's a photo of them. It's the Gilmore and the Nichols. And we're told, of course, the seas were rolling, and he went out there in complete darkness and rescued six people. He was quite the, the hero of the lighthouse service, I think we'd call him. So he was here for so many years. He served on Plum and Pilot, also in Milwaukee. Unbelievable. This is what Pilot Island looks like today. It's part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's a bird sanctuary. So besides lighthouses, Ken and I like to go birding. We enjoy birds. However, historic buildings and lighthouses, bird poop and everything else, <laughs> it's bird poop. It really yeah, is. It is. You can see there's nothing left of the greenery. They don't mix. So there's a friends group here, and they've raised some funds. They're fixing things up on Plum Island. They've done some roofing work on the keeper's quarters, but you can see the fog signal building is collapsing in upon itself, but we were able to find a photo of what the fog signal mechanism looked like back in the day. So the huge building was just full of this machinery. We were told that the fog signal was so loud that they had chickens on the island, but the chicks and the eggs never hatched, that they were all scrambled due to the vibrations. I don't know, it makes for a good story. It, it, yeah, it's a joke, right? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Here's the Friends of Plum and Pilot. And I think this is you. If you think back 150 plus years ago, you know, wooden schooners plying through death's door uh, must have been quite a sight. Today, these modern super tankers still come and go, obviously, with better technology than mariners had uh, back then. Pilot Island is in the distance. That little bitty blip that you see is, is the lighthouse. Uh, even with modern GPS and radar, you know, satellite technology, uh, which the new ships rely on, uh, lighthouse keepers could not have imagined years ago what uh, someday would, would uh, take place. We're going back to Plum Island. <laughs> the original Plum Island light was here. The need for uh, a pilot island light I mentioned. This desk door straight with its currents uh, wind shifts, uh, the, the waters of Green Bay and Lake Michigan mixing. Uh, there was a need in this area for a couple of unique lighthouses. They're called range lights. We'll talk about those uh, briefly. So two more lighthouses were built back here on Plum Island in 1896. The tall uh, structure you see on the left is called a rear range light, very large keeper's quarters. This one is on the same island. It's about a thousand foot from the other one. And what do what range lights do is you have one that's in 
farther in the back, higher elevation, the one in the front is shorter, and when you get, I got too many things to, uh, <laughs> to push can, here. Want me to hold the mic for you? Yeah. Oh, Let me help you. In, in, see, I'm doing the wrong thing here. <laughs> I can't, I can't, can't I can't walk and chew gum. It's, it's okay. true. In place of that short lighthouse, eventually put this modern uh, day marker. But these white and red lines, if you line them up vertically, uh, best door straight has uh, different currents, as I mentioned, different channels, very shallow areas. There's a straight line course that's uh, the safe passage uh, through the uh, uh, th through the strait, and the mariners need to line them up in a vertical line. We'll, we'll touch on this when we get to Bailey's Harbor a little bit later. Uh, but these markers are very important, and they take the place of the old uh, historic range lights. Mm -hmm. There's a very large keeper's quarters on Plum Island, which has had very little work done on it for many, many years. It was not uncommon for large facilities to have other, a lot of other buildings, and you think nowadays, boy, that's, you know, being a historical society, I'm sure you folks can understand uh, how much work that potentially uh, can be. There was also in Door County a number of locations that had life-saving stations. These are in addition to lighthouses. These were uh, men that got into boats in terrible weather to go rescue ships that were uh, stranded. So there was a, uh, a Plum Island life-saving station on the other side of the island. I want to tell them the motto of the Life Saving oh, Service. Yeah. You have to go out, but you don't have to come back. <laughs> Wearing nice, safe cork vest <laughs> and a yellow slicker. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> very brave men, very brave. This beautiful item is the fourth order Fresnel lens that was originally in the Plum Island rear range light, the tall light that we showed you. It currently resides in the Maritime Museum. It's called the Death's Door Maritime Museum in Gills Rock. It's beautifully displayed so everyone's able to see it and enjoy it. The U.S. Coast Guard and the government is getting out of the Fresnel lens business. They're removing lenses from as many lighthouses as they can. We're actually going to have two that remain in lighthouses in Wisconsin. Most states are only allowed to have one, so we're kind of lucky here to be able to keep two. Back to the map. We have to go a little bit further south now, and we're going to travel down to Bailey's Harbor. And our first light here is called the Old Bailey's Harbor Light. Not the best location, as we're going to find out in short order here. We learned that Mr. Allenson Sweet was the shipping company that Captain Justice Bailey served with. And Captain Bailey said, this is a great natural harbor. Mr. Sweet agreed. There was lumber to be had. He petitioned the government for money to build a lighthouse. Surprisingly, no money ever <laughs> came. So he built the lighthouse and attached keeper's quarters at his own expense. Here's Mr. Sweet. Looks very serious, doesn't he? Here are some very fancy ladies back in the day having a picnic at the Old Bailey's Harbor Light. Take a look at the lantern room up at the top. It's called a birdcage style, and the locals in Door County do call this the Old Birdcage Light. It's in rough shape. This is a privately owned lighthouse with attached keeper's quarters. We understand the owners aren't too interested in historic preservation, so it appears that at some point the tower will collapse and there's nothing anybody can do because it belongs to them. This was taken from the water a number of years ago. We landed on the island in air. We didn't know it was private. We got yelled at and uh, <laughs> we went back on a boat and took this photo. It's, it's quite picturesque. Well, here we go, moving back. Well, was discussing range lights briefly before. Uh, most lighthouses throughout the world were to identify various cities ports and, and towns. A few of them were built specifically for hazardous areas. I mentioned the ones on, on Plum Island. Bailey's Harbor was another location where there was one straight, safe course into the harbor. And the old Bailey's light really didn't, didn't help that out. So in place of the old Bailey's birdcage light, three other lighthouses in the greater Bailey's Harbor area sprung up, all of them in 1869. The arrow here shows the, the straight course uh, into, the, into the harbor. That's the safe uh, 
way to go. Two lighthouses again make, make up a range light. The shorter one is towards the shore. The one that looks like an old schoolhouse in the back is farther back and is actually elevated a, a little bit higher. What the mariner needs to do is to align this. There's a lamp in here. There's a lamp in the front one. And align those again in that straight vertical line. This gentleman, Joseph Harris Jr., was one of the lighthouse keepers at the range lights. Interestingly, his father, Joseph Sr., uh, was a proponent of what was called the Sturgeon Bay Ship Canal. Originally, Sturgeon Bay did not go all the way through from the Lake Michigan side uh, to the Green Bay side. And Mr. Harris Sr. wanted to have that eventually uh, dug. What it did, though, it promoted other new lights in the southern part of Door County, but it actually had a, a detrimental effect on Bailey's Harbor. Bailey's Harbor was not as important once the opening of the Sturgeon Bay uh, Canal happened. Mm -hmm. This is Henry and Eve Gaddy. Uh, they were lighthouse keepers. He was the head keeper. She was an assistant. Uh, he was at the range, they were at the range lights for a number of decades. We did some research. Mr. Gaddy had a, had a car. That was pretty unusual back <laughs> that, that far ago. Uh, we sent this image on the right to some car <laughs> experts, historians. It's a 1912 Buick. Wow. <laughs> Mr. Gaddy had to be very proud of his, uh, of his vehicle. Henry is here in his lighthouse keeper's uh, uniform. Uh, all the gentlemen there are having uh, a beer. If you blow up this photograph, it says Miller on this, so it is Miller time. Honest to goodness. <laughs> They're all dressed up. Yeah. I mentioned before a life-saving uh, service uh, station. Thank you. Uh, there was also one in addition to the lighthouses in Bailey's Harbor. This lighthouse life-saving service in Bailey's Harbor as well. The Bailey's Harbor range lights today reside in an area called the Ridges Sanctuary. It's a natural preserve. It's beautiful. It's got uh, very rare plants and orchids. Uh, quite, quite the place to be. A lot of the lighthouses, the two lighthouses there though, they fell into disrepair. The photo on the right is actually fairly old. And, and if you can imagine, historically, People were at lighthouses all the time. They were painting, they were upkeeping uh, the place. Some of that went by the wayside um, in, in our lifetime. This is you. Sure did. The Ridges Sanctuary was formed in the 1930s. And closer to the shore, there was a unit called a day marker. Kind of took away from the picturesque nature of the range lights. And that was there for years. And one of the volunteers with the lighthouse petitioned the government to take the doggone thing down, and they did it, which is incredible. Several years ago, they wanted to move that front range light a bit further inland, but still keep it in line as a range light. It was very close to the road, so every time they plowed or salted, it was damaged even more. And I think the next photo shows it. Beautifully restored. They did a great job. And they do open for tours, which is wonderful. This is how it looks at night. They light it every night. It's on a timer, and it's recognized by the U.S. Coast Guard as official range lights. So, again, boaters do use the lights. So you're out on your boat, and here, again, you need to be on range. Directly up and down, the lights need to be right over each other. Well, you're too far to the right. You better correct your course there, Captain. Oops. Oopsie, too far. Too far. <laughs> go back, please. <laughs> Help us, there we go, now we're on range. And that's how it would look at night with the red light on the bottom and the white one on the top. An ingenious system, really. This is a friend of ours, his name is Mr. Ed Miller, but when he's at the Ridges light, at the Bailey's Harbor light, he is Mr. Gaddi. So he dresses up in his keeper's uniform, he gives tours. You'll see him later on at another <laughs> lighthouse too. And I think this is you. I mentioned that uh, the range lights are at the Ridges Sanctuary. Uh, they use some of the buildings for some of their nature center uh, programming, but over the years it, it needed a lot of upkeep. 
Uh, over the last three or four years, they've embarked on a several year, multi-million dollar restoration of these two lighthouses. Lighthouse preservation is not cheap. <laughs> this is what it looks like today. It's, it's gorgeous. Uh, they're working on the in interior rooms now to bring them up to about the early 1900s era, uh, again, for tours and for the public to enjoy. I mentioned before, three lighthouses took the place of the old Bailey's light. Uh, this one uh, also did. Uh, again, 1869, the range lights and Cana Island uh, were built the same year. In addition to the range lights, there was a need for a tall coastal beacon, but a little bit further up the coast, ab about two miles north of Bailey's Harbor. This is the tall, classic white tower. If you think about Cana Island, it might look like a lighthouse in, in your mind. We're going to finish the program at, at the end with detailed history of, of Cana Island. We'll move on, though. We're going to move now to the Green Bay side, Lake Michigan's over here, mentioned before, the Death Door Strait, Rock Island Passage around Potawatomi. Once you got into the uh, Green Bay side, there were several islands there that w would be helpful to have navigational beacons. There was a lot of boat traffic going from Green Bay you know, around Potawatomi through the Death Door. Eventually, when this canal was, was fur finished, it was, uh, it, it shortened that. We'll, we'll touch on that in, in a little bit. So it's very important to have a couple of lights on islands in the bay. 1868, two different lighthouses were built in the Green Bay. This is the Eagle Bluff Light. It's in uh, Peninsula State Park today. Uh, the Door County Historical Society and the State DNR take uh, care of this facility. These are some uh, historic mm -hmm. photos uh, of Eagle Bluff. William and Julia Duclan were keepers here for a, a number of decades. They had seven children, as you can see from the photo, all boys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this lighthouse is not the largest one, but to have two adults and seven children at this lighthouse was, was interesting. Uh, later on, we heard one of the, the youngest Duclan boy, Walter, when he became a much older senior citizen, he came back to the lighthouse when they were renovating it, and he told people the stories of this room we did this in, this was the music room. He told a story, too, that he said he and his brothers got into some mischief, actually a lot of mischief. When they took all the interior paint, they couldn't believe the number of layers of paint and Walter said, my mother gave us a paintbrush whenever we got into trouble, and he just kind of smiled. <laughs> uh, this is a Duclan wedding. We were not sure who, who got married here. Uh, the Duclans were a very musical family in addition to uh, entertaining a lot. We will make no uh, statement of the gentleman <laughs> with the... Uh, the lacy apron, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I think there may have been some adult beverages uh, consumed at I this... <laughs> this wedding. Eagle Bluff is, is a really neat place. Uh, it's open spring through fall uh, in Peninsula State Park. Uh, the Historical Society does a wonderful job of, of did a wonderful job of restoring it. There's tours that go to the lighthouse, these trolleys and other buses throughout Door County. Tourism uh, come to Eagle Bluff uh, every single day. There's our friend Ed Miller again. He's going to impersonate a different lighthouse <laughs> keeper here. Uh, they had a, a, a lot of music, as I mentioned. Walter was very helpful in uh, telling them about certain furnishings uh, that were at the lighthouse. This lighthouse goes back to, it's refurbished to about the 1920s, uh, one of the best restorations on all the Great Lakes. There you go. Uh, we've, they do tours sometimes in the evening as well, and there's Keeper Ed went from the range lights over to, <laughs> to Eagle Bluff. He's, he's a lot of fun. There he is. So we're going to go back to the Strawberry Channel again, and we're going to visit Chambers Island Light. The Chambers Island Light is the same exact design as Eagle Bluff. 
only its tower is eight-sided, and the one at Eagle Bluff is four-sided. And this was so mariners during the day could tell which was which, because otherwise they look the same. Cream City brick, same color roof, but they, w no, that's this one. This is Eagle Bluff. It's only a four-sided tower. This is what it looks like today. It's in a Gibraltar County Park, and if you have your own pleasure craft, you can get out there and take a little stroll through the building if the caretakers are there. They used to have boat tours, but only during the Door County Lighthouse Festivals is this open for boat traffic. This is a very sad story, and I get to be the one to <laughs> tell it to you. Sorry. I'm sorry. This is Samuel and Mary Hansen, who served here at this lighthouse for 13 years. Early on, however, Mary, the mom, died suddenly. Their youngest son, Edgar, died of a burst appendix. They couldn't get to shore on the other side fast enough, and Clifford drowned after he fell through the ice. After that, we're told Mr. Hansen left the lighthouse service. I don't blame him. Here's what she looks like from the water. You'll notice there is no lantern and <laughs> there is no lens. Someone said it was removed and sent to North Dakota. Have no clue. It doesn't make any sense, but it's, it's gone. probably in somebody's private uh, Yeah, collection. I think those things just disappear, <laughs> don't they? This is you. Moving a bit uh, further south, uh, this is uh, the furthest south at any Door County lighthouses. We're going to discuss four different lighthouses in what's called the, the Sturgeon Bay. Uh, this is actually the, the bay here, Green Bay here again, Lake Michigan on the right. There was a need, especially once the uh, Sturgeon Bay Canal was finished, from 1862 to 1872, it took them a decade uh, to dig and blast about two miles of rock and, and debris. Uh, once they did make meet the waters of Lake Michigan and Green Bay, uh, they had schooners going uh, back and forth uh, through, the, through the channel. This reduced the amount of mileage around the top of Door County almost 100 miles. That was a lot of money. Uh, and it was very successful. It had a negative impact on some of the other lights that I mentioned before, uh, but it really, uh, Sturgeon Bay became a very busy uh, area. The first lights in this area, you might have heard this term before, range lights. Uh, there were, if you've ever been to Sturgeon Bay and you're heading north uh, over the old bridge, uh, these two lighthouses were just to the left, which would be the west, of the, uh, the old iron bridge, uh, 1881 is the date. Again, a small uh, light, bigger light, vertical line, safe channel through. Uh, this area was called the Dunlap Reef. These are the Dunlap Reef lighthouses. This gentleman is Cliff Sanderson. He was at the uh, range lights at Dunlap Reef uh, for over 30 years. He was also in the lighthouse service a total of more than 40 years. This was not uncommon. Lighthouse keepers generally uh, stayed on that particular job for many, many years. Uh, just these old historic archival photos are just, are just priceless. Mr. Sanderson has a star on his lapel. It's called an efficiency star. Uh, his lighthouse what that meant to the federal government, you are doing an exemplary job uh, at your lighthouse. It looks like a stinker to me. <laughs> I like it. Back to the map. So we're going back to the Sturgeon Bay again to the opposite end. So lighthouses were needed here to guide the ships in. The first lighthouse, though, really kind of small in 1882, just a small wooden structure at the end of a wooden pier. And it didn't take long for mariners to demand something better. So not too long after that, only in 1903, they put up a much longer out into the lake pier with this lovely building. At that time, it was white. Today, it's painted red. The entire building was a fog signal. So there wasn't much room in there other than for all the machinery. Someone owns this privately today, but we have no idea what they plan to do with it. Next for some nice photos, though, with the elevated catwalk. There aren't ma very many of these that remain in Wisconsin or even in the U.S. anymore, so we're lucky to have one so close by. You know, sunrise is always beautiful, right, because you've gotten up and it's always wonderful, right, except for when it's not. We don't show you the junk. 
These are the mornings we got up early and we were really rewarded with beautiful, beautiful skies. And sometimes it's calm. One, yeah, it's never been that calm again when we've here. been there. Nope, never. There was also a life-saving station here back in the day, and you can see these gentlemen practicing. They would practice their life-saving skills on a daily basis where they would go out and they'd actually make them tip the boat. And they'd have to scamper back on and tip it over and <laughs> every day in that cold water, but that was part of their job. Today, though, all these buildings house the U.S. Coast Guard at this location. I think this is you. That's you. In addition to the pier light at Sturgeon Bay, mariners wanted a taller, again, what's called a, a coastal beacon. So in 1898, this very tall structure uh, was built. It immediately had problems with wind uh, causing vibrations in the uh, tower. They tried a number of remedies. Some worked, some didn't. Uh, they tried these guy wires supported, you know, the base of the uh, lens to, to the ground. That didn't help too much. Today, though, this modern lattice work at the bottom, as well as these other struts that support the, the base of the lens, are, are very, very rigid. This is a very uh, strong tower. This happens to be the tallest light in Door County at 98 these are some historic uh, mm -hmm. photos of the canal. You can see the canal station light that I just described. Barb was talking about the pier light. So really not that far from each other. This was the life-saving station. And we mentioned that this, this has become the uh, uh, US Coast Guard station that still is in operation today. The Sturgeon Bay Canal, we can't say it, the amount of money it saved, the amount of goods that went through the canal uh, really was a, a game changer for a lot of uh, uh, towns in, in Door County. This is the U.S. Coast Guard station today. Uh, they, they take care of both the canal light, the tall one, and, and the pier light. Going back to the other end of the canal, so of course you need a light to guide you safely into the canal. So the Sherwood Point light was built here, and the area is named for Peter Sherwood, who settled here in 1836. And here's a shot from the water to show you what it looks like if you're in your boat. The small building in the front that looks a little bit like a uh, pyramid actually housed a fog bell, and today it houses radio equipment just for historical purposes only. It's all automated. This is Miss Minnie Hesch, who visited Door County in 1884. She liked it so much, she actually ended up moving there. Five years later, she married the assistant keeper of the Sherwood Point Light, Mr. William Cockums. And we're told today that Miss Minnie's spirit still is in the lighthouse. Apparently, she's a very friendly ghost. She's been known to do dishes, set the table for breakfast, and someone even put up a plaque in her honor in the yard. The building today, though, is used as a morale cottage for military folks, retired and active. So we've been inside a couple of times mm -hmm. just because we showed up and asked. <laughs> yeah, we just asked really nice. And this handsome gentleman is Conrad Stram. He served here for 12 years and at eight different lighthouses in his career that also spanned about 40 years. And this is what it looks like from the grounds today. The lens has since been removed, though, and it's at the Door County Maritime Museum in Sturgeon Bay. Ah, it's so pretty at dusk, it is. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, All commercial right. time. Commercial <laughs> break. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that uh, Cana Island, uh, north of Bailey's Harbor, is the premier lighthouse in Door County. Uh, if you've never been there, if you've never been to Door County and you want to see a lighthouse, if you can only pick one, this would be uh, the one we would recommend. It, it dates to 1869, the same year that the Bailey's Harbor Range lights were built to replace uh, the old Bailey's light. Barb and I first got our interest in lighthouses in Door County at Cana Island 40-ish years ago, a, a long time ago. So long. It's just, oh. just a fascinating <laughs> uh, place. Yeah, 40, huh? Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. The, the oh. name Cana Island is accurate when Lake Michigan's level is high enough to make it an island. And we'll, we'll touch on, 
obviously that changes with the lake level. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the location of, of Cana Island. Uh, Bailey's Harbor is down here. It's just a, a few miles north. Cana Island actually is a brick tower. It's a uh, Cream City brick. This is the only known photo of it prior to the time uh, that it was encased in metal sheeting that you see today. After about three decades, uh, the government realized the brickwork was weathering. It's a very exposed island, uh, a lot of wind, a lot of waves. So they encased it in the metal sheeting that you still see today. Here's the schematic on the left of the government drawing. Uh, this still uh, is on the outside of the, the tower today. Cana Island still has its original 1869 French-made Fresnel lens in it. It's called a third order. Order means size. The smaller the number, the bigger and more powerful the lens is. Uh, coastal lights typically had third order or second order lenses in it. Uh, Cana Island still has its lens in the tower. Uh, we are told uh, there's two lighthouses in the state that will eventually keep their Fresnel lens. One is in the Apostle Islands at Devil's Island. Uh, Cana Island will be the other. Uh, most of them are being taken out. Uh, they go to historical societies, they go to public libraries, they go to maritime uh, museums, and that, that's a good thing that the public can uh, see them up close. This is Augustin Jean Fresnel. He was a French physicist in the 1800s. He invented the lens that would bear his name after his passing. Uh, he did not realize how instrumental this lens would be. Fresnel lenses revolutionized lighthouses throughout the world, not just in Wisconsin, not just in Door County. The reason for that is primarily twofold. The, the lens projected the light much more brilliantly, and it, number two, it could be seen because of that many, many more miles out, on, be it the world's oceans, lakes, rivers, the coastline of Door County. Barb and I have been fortunate one time to get into the lantern uh, room with the Coast Guard. Uh, this is what it looks like. The uh, photo on the left is actually only half of the lens. It stands about five feet tall, many hundreds of pounds, and it's dozens and dozens of hand-polished glass prisms in this brass beehive-looking uh, apparatus. It was made in Paris by a company uh, run by Henri Lapotte. Uh, all Fresnel lenses were manufactured in Paris, disassembled, shipped over to the U.S., reassembled in the towers uh, of, the, uh, of the lighthouses. Uh, this is what I was trying to say. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or an engineer. All of these lenses magnify and bend the light source from the middle that goes off in every direction. It bends it in one direction, magnifies the light. Again, a more brilliant light, a, more, uh, a light that can be seen many more miles out on the, uh, in this case, Lake Michigan. We love to go to Cana Island at different Sometimes, sometimes uh, dawn if we can get up, uh, sometimes at, yeah. at dusk. Yeah, dusk is easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in all the years that Cana Island was in service, there were only nine head keepers that worked here. And here's a list of them, and we're going to detail a few of them now because the history of the families is really, to us, very interesting. This is the second keeper at Cana. This is the Julius Warren family, and a very large family it was. So they had lots of help around the lighthouse. And when they left the lighthouse service, they built what is today known as the Warren House. It resides today in Heritage Village at Big Creek, which is just north of Sturgeon Bay. And we were told at the time they built this home, this was palatial. Nobody had a home like this. And you can see how big it is. And they were very proud of it. And he went back to his farming roots, we're told. It was okay. Hannah Foster and Jesse Brown, the next keepers here at Cana Island. And great archival photos. We've met descendants of these folks who were kind enough to share their priceless family photos with us. This is Susan Scotton, who married Mr. Dresden and also became a lighthouse keeper's wife. She came from New York, but apparently lighthouse keeping 
was okay with her. There are stories of women that came from the larger cities and married a lighthouse keeper and said, oh, no, <laughs> this is too much work. It's too isolated. But she loved it, and her daughters did as well. The logbook entries usually were mundane. The weather today, what we did, what ships may have passed. But there's a very interesting logbook entry. I have to read it to you. It's from Mr. Sanderson, and this is in 1928. Thick fog on the lake. Steamer M.J. Bartlemy ran aground south side of the island at 1 p.m. Did not know for sure. Boat was stranded until 3 p.m. when the fog lifted so could see it. And here's the Bartlemy in a little bit of fog. And there are still remnants today of this on the beach at Cana. There's all kinds of cable and odd pieces of metal that float up and down. I forget how many years it took for them to finally scrap it, but it was a great tourist attraction for years. These are some of the um, children at Cana Island. Cana Island was a very busy place. Uh, as Barb mentioned before, usually families were fairly large. Uh, it was not unusual for, for children to uh, be involved with the chores at, uh, at lighthouses. Uh, these are the Weiss and Stram uh, children with some of the toys of the day, Not, nothing fancy. You know, a teddy bear, a buggy, a, a doll, uh, very simple toys. <laughs> we included this. This is a, a letter from the uh, inspector of one of the lighthouses. At, it happened to be Cana Island. Uh, the family had a newborn child that was born at Cana Island. And the, the federal government was a kind of a black and white, by the book kind of organization. You know, they, they had a lot of rules, uh, fairly, uh, fairly strict. This letter, tongue-in-cheek, says they are going to allow permanent visitation of their, their new guest, which was their, their, their newborn child. So, so they, they kind of had a, a little bit of a sense of humor. We met, uh, we met Virginia. Where is Virginia? Where is Virginia? Virginia Dresden and her sister June. We met her. Uh, about a decade ago in Milwaukee, these photos come from her. Uh, would love to put in a plug too for historical societies, public libraries, uh, descendants of lighthouse keepers. Our books and our programs would not have existed without that collaborative help. Excellent, excellent resources all the way around. These priceless family photos from the Dresdens, uh, we would not have been able to attain. Cana Island was a it was a fun place to be, we were told, uh, mm -hmm. when you were a, a child. Yeah, yeah. You did some of the work, the parents did most of it, and you got to go outside and, okay. and play. Uh, this is the Dresden children again. You'll note, you might notice their matching outfits. Uh, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Dresden so sewed all of the, the dresses and the clothes for the girls. This cat was named Tabby, we are told, from Virginia. <laughs> she remembered everything. This photo. It's fun for Barbara and I. This, this is Cana Island. Here's a pedestal. It has a sundial on it. We, when we met with Virginia, she said, yeah, the sundial, you know, sunny days, it was really accurate. It had an inscription on it. Do you want to know what it said? <laughs> yes. Sure. It said, my face tells of sunny hours. What can you say of yours? We would never okay. have known that without Virginia. Virginia. Because it's gone. It's not there anymore. Yeah. Work. Work. Even visitors had to work when they came to visit Cana. This is Edgar Bletcher, who was assigned a painting task, and apparently there's more paint on him <laughs> than there is on whatever the Dickens is he's painting, but he's working. And the adults were the ones that had to paint the tower. So you can see how that was done. It doesn't look OSHA approved to me. This is how they did it. But we did learn women keepers were exempt from painting the tower. So that was good news to me. <laughs> Happy to hear that. And there was a boathouse at Cana Island many years ago. And we can see the lighthouse tender ship leaving. So they would have brought supplies. And sometimes the dreaded lighthouse inspector would come. And early on, we're told that it was always a surprise. But later on, the keepers somehow had a system where they could let the next island or the next lighthouse know the keeper is coming. You better, <laughs> the lighthouse inspector is coming. You better be ready. It was the white glove test they expected you to be in your Sunday best family, the kids, everybody. There was a story of a mom, I think, in the Apostle Islands that the inspector came and 
home is spotless and she had put all the dishes in the stove. He looked in the stove and kind of gave her the, the look. Then he wanted to see the children's bedrooms and she would not permit it. She said, my children do not work for the government. <laughs> it's my husband and I, but not my kids, so good for Little is known of what we call the McCarthy years at Cana Island after the light station was abandoned. They were here for over 25 years, but there's very little known of what they did. But then a few years after they left, Rosie and Louie Janda and their workers came <laughs> along to Cana Island. They were here for 18 summers. So every summer while they were there, they made a lot of improvements, a lot of it at their own expense, and some of the money came from the Maritime Museum to help shore up some of the buildings on Cana. This is in what year? 2007 when they transferred the ownership of Cana from the federal government to the Door County Maritime Museum and the County of Door. It was a big deal. <laughs> Who is that little? Uh, Barb and I have been visiting Cana Island, as I mentioned, for a, a very long time, uh, decades. Uh, the little child in this picture is 41 years old. That's our daughter, Sarah. How did that happen? Historically, the the level of Lake Michigan, the Great Lakes levels, as you folks know, uh, rises and falls. Uh, back in, this would have been about 80, 1983, 84. Mm -hmm. uh, right, yeah. The lake yeah. level was, you could easily walk to Cana Island. You'd get a little wet, but it, it, was, it was manageable. Uh, that changed a lot over the last couple of decades. I don't know why we put that one in there, Barbara. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> take that out. <laughs> After uh, Cana Island was transferred to the county and to the Maritime Museum, uh, they embarked on a multi-year, you've probably heard this before, a multi-million dollar uh, renovation uh, at Cana Island. There was, historically, there was not a parking lot for people. This is the most visited lighthouse in Door County. Tens of thousands of people every year visit Cana Island. So there is now a small parking lot run by the uh, museum. Uh, initially, about five plus years ago, they started working just on the brickwork, the Milwaukee Cream City brickwork, on the keeper's quarters at Cana. But eventually they had to do some more uh, substantial changes. There was an old barn that they renovated. Uh, looks quite a bit better than it did. It was actually falling apart. Inside are some uh, farm implements, also some, they, they had other animals at Cana Island. It was not unusual to have chickens, cows, uh, they would tend their fruit trees, they would have uh, gardens, mm -hmm. uh, gives you a good sense of the history uh, on the island. Many times most lighthouses had other buildings. Some of them had fog signal buildings. Cana Island did not, but there was almost always a fuel building outside. Uh, some of the uh, flammable liquids uh, that they used were quite, quite flammable. Uh, this building towards the rear is called the Privy, that's a fancy name for an outhouse. And uh, Cana Island has had that renovated as well. And this was a deluxe model. It was, it was a two-seater. <laughs> there, there is no <laughs> privacy, <laughs> no social distancing, sorry. Uh, you did your business and, oh, gosh. and you went, you went uh, on your way. Oh. Historically, we mentioned the, the causeway, the route to Cana Island can be bone dry. It can be a few inches deep. Uh, the Maritime Museum has a wagon and a tractor. Three, four years ago they actually got a larger, taller tractor and wagon because the lake level was, was quite a bit higher. Three years ago the lake level was about a foot, foot and a half. More, more recently, not, not this year anymore, when Wind and waves come around the island. You're, you're trying to get over uh, yeah, no. to this area here. Uh, you are not getting to Cana Island. Uh, three years ago, the Maritime Museum opens uh, up the island from spring through fall. They lost more than a third of their season just because of the, the weather and the, uh, the lake level. Mm -hmm. They built a, uh, a small visitor center uh, at Cana Island. Uh, main reason we put this, this is the cover of our book. We've been fortunate to be members of the Maritime Museum and they have just been, been super people. Here's the, they, they call it the interpretive center. It's a, a great building. If the weather is good, you can go in there and, <laughs> and, and shop. 
Uh, we're going to end the program now with some of our favorite photos of Cana Island. Barb and I have been there many, many times. Uh, sometimes not the uh, easiest times to get up to, especially very early in the morning, <laughs> later at night. But some of our best photography in Door County of lighthouses uh, comes uh, from Cana Island. Sometimes we get a nice reflection. The gray sunrises that we saw, we, we don't show you those. Mm -hmm. There's a circular stairway in many of the lighthouses. The taller lights particularly have circular stairways. Cana Island, the lighthouse itself right now, is they're renovating inside the keeper's quarters. It's supposed to be open next month. So if you do get to Cana Island right now, you can get to the island, but you cannot get into the tower. Hopefully next month that, that will change. We've even been there a few times in, in the winter. Sure, why not? Sometimes you get the moon lined up really neat with the light on. All federal lighthouses you know, flew the American flag. Again, a nice morning with brilliant uh, colors. Dull gray mornings, well, no. you, 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 you look for another day. For this is the, the cover photo of our Wisconsin Lighthouse book, and we were just blessed. The, the lake level was down that particular year, but there was enough water in the foreground and the sky was just right to reflect uh, the Cana Island lantern. I mentioned before that Cana Island's lens will stay in the tower. Uh, we think that's a, a really good, appropriate, historic uh, thing. Oh boy. If you see these people again, run, run the other way. Okay. Yeah. We understand. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.